I love today's story because it challenges me on a deep level, and I hope it'll challenge you. Uh, last week, I shared the picture of Christianity that I had growing up, and it was um, defined by these things. Let's see if I can get it up. There it is. The, my early definition of a Christian was somebody who, one, prayed to accept Jesus. Two, and I added this one from last week because I don't know how I didn't put it up there last week, but two, believes correctly. They believe the correct doctrine. Three, they practice personal acts of devotion like praying and reading their Bible. A Christian is defined by being separate from, this, from sin and from the world. And then uh, number five, witnessing was basically done by confronting sinners and telling them to turn to Jesus. So bottom line is, I basically thought that Christianity was defined by correct beliefs and correct actions. That's what a Christian was. Doing, th- doing the right things the right way and believing the right things with certainty. That's what a Christian was. And I believe that Jesus wanted me to be separate from the wrong things and those who do them. And so I knew our mission in Matthew 28 was go and make disciples. But my definition of, definition of Christianity, it required me to do it from a distance. So when I was growing up, uh, in high school anyway, when I became a follower of Christ, we'd go uh, on Monday nights, and we had what was called visitation. We'd all meet at the church, and there was, you know, about 20 of us. We'd eat dinner, and we'd go out and knock on doors of people who visited our church. And our hope the whole time was that we could get them to say that prayer to accept Jesus. That's why we went. We'd go to the park, and we'd hand out these, these things, these brochures. We called them tracts. And we'd hand them out to strangers, hoping that they, too, would pray to accept Jesus. We'd go on mission trips, and we'd preach to strangers on the street. That's how we made disciples, because we couldn't... We had to confront people because we didn't know them well. And I was never encouraged at that age to intentionally build relationships with people far from God. It, was, it wasn't modeled for me. I didn't see other people doing that. And so sharing Jesus with the outsiders, witnessing, it was confrontation. Convincing them they, convincing them they were wrong and hopefully changing their mind. And then we had last week's story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And it completely wrecked that idea of the separation from people because he initiated a conversation and a relationship. He, he approached her with a need. He needed something. He was hot and he was tired. And he needed something that only she could provide, water. And so he asked for water. And then in the conversation, he showed her that he had something that would meet a need for her. And it was salvation. And so he initiated this conversation with a Samaritan woman, totally not okay in that culture. And even in the midst of this, he revealed an identity that he had not even revealed to his disciples. He told her, he he used for himself the name, I am. It's crazy. He broke all the rules then because he spent two days with the Samaritans, eating with them and teaching with them and living among them. And Jesus' definition of Christianity shows that number four and five on this list aren't, aren't right. They're not right. We're not called to be separate from the people of the world. We're called to be separate from the philosophy of the world, that it's all about me, and that my value is based on on what I own, what I accomplish, the experiences that I have, that this is all there is, so get as much of it as you can. That's the philosophy of the world. That's what we're called to be separate from, not people. Jesus came for people. But... As a follower of Christ, my life is not my own. I am God's. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer my life, but Christ's who lives in me. And as a follower of Christ, I am to love others as much as I love my, as myself, no matter who they are, what they believe. So, thanks for the intro. That was last week's story. And it was dealing with numbers four and five on this list. Now, today's story deals a little bit more with the first three of my early definition. And it all starts with in the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. So you heard the verse already, uh, or the passage. 
in Mark 1. And I love this because it says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they were fishermen. They fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Okay, can we have a little bit of honesty here? Let's be straight. How many of you have heard this before and wondered, who does that? A guy walks up while you're fishing. Hey, you, give up your career. Follow me. And they go, okay. And they do it. Seriously. I mean, raise your hand if that sounds a little weird to you. It's okay. It's a, we're all in the family. We love Jesus. It's a little weird. Now, Last week I mentioned something that really helps here because knowing the purpose of a book of the Bible helps us really understand what's being said. And Mark's gospel was the first account written about Jesus. And his purpose was never to write a history book. That wasn't his purpose. He was writing to Roman Gentiles unfamiliar with this guy named Jesus. He was trying to convince them that Jesus came from God, that Jesus was he offered salvation and was worthy to be followed and worshiped mark's gospel is kind of like the action movie of the gospels it's true it's like there's miracle after miracle after miracle and then when there's a teaching it's short and it's like miracle boom teaching miracle boom teaching i with phones it really makes it hard because i mean most of us don't use paper bibles anymore many of us many of us we use like you know our ipads or tablets and phones. And so you don't really see this, but if you flip through Mark, you will see, like if, if your Bible has section, has the scripture in sections, you'll see short section, short section, short section. It's amazing. You know, like Luke and Matthew and John, you'll see whole big sections of text under one title, not in Mark. It's like, boom, miracle, miracle, teaching, miracle, miracle. It's amazing. So when Mark talks about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew and they drop their nets and immediately follow, Mark is leaving out a ton. And the reason we know that is because the gospel of Luke fills in so many of these gaps. Now, Luke's purpose was to write a history. That was his whole point. How do we know this? He tells us, and I just wanted to read the very first few verses of Luke. He says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. He's talking about, probably, the Gospel of Mark, which was circulating. Maybe Matthew. Maybe other things that were written down that were just kind of snippets about Jesus. And so Luke's like, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I've pulled all the documents together. I've read everything. I also have decided to write an account accurate account for you. So when we read Luke, you read it like a history book. When you read Mark, you read it like a graphic novel. I mean, it's like just faster and it's more. And so he's not necessarily, he doesn't care about putting things in order. He has a purpose. He's showing you Jesus, the miracle guy from God who is offers salvation, where Luke's like, no, 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 no. Jesus did this. Jesus did this, Jesus did this. And his account of Jesus calling those first disciples has so much more information. Because, and it's in, you can look it up, it's in Luke 5. But basically, Jesus is teaching, and I, I would read it, but it's too long, because it's Luke. And um, Jesus is teaching crowds of people by the Sea of Galilee. He asks one of the fishermen, Peter, who he probably knows because the Galilee, the little cities, the towns in the Galilee, they're small. Everybody knows everybody. And so he asked Peter, can I sit in your boat? Will you keep it steady while I teach the crowds? Because there's lots of crowds up on the, on the shore. He just wanted to go out a little bit and that way everybody could hear him. Peter says, you know, let's do it. So that happens. Jesus is teaching the crowds. You can imagine Peter's in the boat just trying to keep it steady. Everything's good. When they're all done, Jesus says to Peter, hey, man, let's go fishing. That's my translation and my accent. But so, hey, let's go fishing. Peter is exhausted. He has been fishing all night and caught nothing. So he tells Jesus this, dude, I'm tired. But because you say it, let's go fishing. And so Jesus, the rabbi, tells Peter, the fisherman, 
where to throw his net. You got to love this because Peter's like, seriously, <laughs> I'm a fisherman. <laughs> and, Peter, and Jesus is like, hey, throw your net over on this side. Okay. <laughs> he throws his net and so many fish immediately are in the net that it starts to break. That has never happened before. Peter is freaking out. He calls his brother Andrew and his business partners, John and James. And he says, get over here. I need your help. They get all of these fish in, and Peter is speechless, which is something that did not happen to him very often. (laughs) The only thing he can say is to Jesus, go away from me. I am a sinful man. I mean, in that moment, Peter knew there was something different about this man, Jesus. And then, after that, Jesus says, follow me, and together we will fish for people. And so they followed Jesus. Now, so you look at that, and then you look at Mark's account, and you go, man, Mark, you left out a lot. I've always struggled with this passage, going, who does that? I mean, that is just so crazy. And then you realize Luke's talking about the same thing and fills in the gaps. So, in both accounts, though, Mark, I mean, because they're they're identical accounts, it's just one has a lot more information. Both of them, the disciples, those men, leave everything and follow him. I mean, you think about it. They left their business and their livelihood. They left their hometown to follow Jesus. They left their plans for the future. I mean, they they had taken this business over from one of their dads, And all of a sudden, I mean, this is their business and they're laying the whole thing down. They left everything familiar to follow Jesus. See, that is so different than most of our experiences. For most Christians, you know, we pray a prayer to accept Jesus. And for some of us, our lives changed pretty dramatically. You know, um, for... I I know marriages that have been saved because people chose to follow Jesus. I know addictions that have been overcome because people have been have chosen to follow Jesus. But regardless of all that transformation, most of us, when we choose Jesus, we keep the same job. We stay in our same house. Many of the same goals of our life are still going to be pursued. For most of us, choosing to follow or to accept Jesus means changing our beliefs so we believe correctly. We used to believe this way, but now we believe this way. And changing some bad behaviors. For most of us, that's what choosing Jesus meant. And that's a great first step. Don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing that. It's great for a while. Because sooner or later, like every relationship that we're involved in, the excitement wears off. Some complain they don't feel God anymore. You know, they do the right things. They read their Bible. They go to church. They, they pray. And don't raise your hand. <laughs> this isn't audience participation time. But, you know, have you been a Christian for a while and you kind of feel like, feel a little empty, feel a little distant from God and you wonder what happened? I mean, is that your story? Because there have been many times in my life it's been my story. It's a normal story. Is there something missing in your faith? When I read this passage and, and in this message, I, I think that maybe sometimes this emptiness or this feeling that we're missing something is because we've been taught to believe that Christianity is primarily about our actions, what we do, and our beliefs, what we believe. Hear me out. Some of you are going, I don't like this one. I know, uh, it's okay. You'll like this, I think. Because Americans, we're doers. We work, we play, we're always going. We're going, going, going. And if we're not busy, if we're not accomplishing something, we're wasting time. We need to be doing something. Even if it's just playing on our phone, to have quiet, to reflect, to think, to engage in relationships where we just sit and talk, these are not common in our life. So that busyness affects our relationship with Jesus. So hear me out. The Western approach, like in America, a follower of Jesus is someone who believes and behaves correctly because we think that if we believe correctly, we know that will lead to us doing the right things. And doing is the end goal. A good Christian is somebody who believes well and does well, period. So Christians, we go into the world, we make disciples. No, we don't. We actually go into the world too often and tell people that they're bad and they need to stop doing bad things. 
We do. That's often what Christians are known for, going into the world and saying, stop sinning. That's bad. Stop it. Like if everybody stopped sinning, the world would be saved, which is not the case at all. I mean, Jesus did not come and say, stop sinning. He said what? Follow me. Oh, I was pointing at the thing, but it's not up there yet. Okay. So now, so, okay, thank you for that. So let me bump into where we're going with this. The Bible wasn't written to Western people. The Bible was written to Middle East, a Middle Eastern culture, and it's so different than the West. See, concerning our busyness, our constant doing, most other countries, even today, think we are crazy. They think Americans are crazy because we work all the time. We spend very little time with our families. We move around our country like, like nothing, and we have very few deep, deep, long-lasting relationships. In other cultures, they, they're like, that's crazy. And I think they might be onto something. See, the Apostle Paul, he even says another step. It's not about just knowing, which is important. Of course it's important. It's not about just doing. Of course doing is important. But there's another step because he says, we, we talked about this verse a couple weeks ago, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to what? Become like his son. Become like his son. So in the Bible, we see over and over that we know, we learn, we do, but doing is not the end goal. Becoming is the end goal. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. It's this becoming. Because Jesus started his ministry calling his disciples to follow him, right? Follow me. We're going to go, make, we're going to go fish for men. They did. He ended his ministry with these words. Go and make disciples of all the nations. That's our mission. Make disciples. So, what is a disciple? What is a disciple? It's somebody who follows their teacher so closely that they become just like their teacher. Knowledge leads to action, and that leads to becoming more and more like Jesus. So, sorry, it's a philosophy. We're getting out of that right now. <laughs> um, if Western approach is a follower of Christ is somebody who does, Eastern approach, follower of Christ is someone who becomes. Now, let's get in, uh, into what it looks like to become like Jesus. You know, we focus so much about what, how we think and what we do and not on who we are and whose we are. But when we do think about becoming, it changes everything. Because for Jesus, being a disciple requires intimacy. Becoming is a relational thing. Do you remember, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, what the name that Jesus used for God? What, what did he call God? Do you remember? Starts with an A, Abba. He called him Abba. Now, that's, that's kind of, it's an Aramaic term. It kind of means daddy. And, and you can imagine it like this, because if you went to Jerusalem right now, and you went into a supermarket, and you saw a three-year-old boy who was lost. He would be walking around calling, Abba, Abba. And when his daddy comes around the corner, he would run and jump into his Abba's arms like only a three-year-old could because that three-year-old, he trusts his Abba. He finds security in his Abba. And I can hear Jesus say, exactly, that is God. He is Abba. Call him Abba. And for most of us, that's such a different picture of God than we're used to because we're Americans and we're smart and we go to school. And so most of us following Christ is intellectual. It's, we, you know, it's expressing our faith by what we believe, that God is all powerful and that Jesus died on the cross and that if we accept Jesus, we will go to heaven. And all of that's great and true, but they don't fill the hole in our hearts. They don't, they don't quench the thirst in our soul. We're created for more. We were created to know God intimately. Because for a disciple, it's not about just information. It's about the whole desire of a disciple is to become like the teacher. So let's look back at Mark 1. Let's look back at Jesus calling his first disciples. Why do you think he picked fishermen? Why didn't he pick people with more education? Because that's what rabbis did. They picked people with education to follow them. Here's how it worked. For about 1,500 years before Jesus, 
the book they studied was Torah. The five books, five first books of the Bible that God gave to Moses. Torah was the foundation of their lives. Torah was what identified them as the people of God. It, and it was the focus of their education. You know, around ages five or six, kids would go to school just like we do. And what they would do is they would learn Torah from a local rabbi. And about the age of 10, most kids, I'm not kidding, I promise, most kids would have the entire Torah memorized. All five books of the Bible, they're thick. Memorized, not just the words, but also the meaning and the significance by 10 years old. And that's when most kids stop going to school. You know, they would, they would learn their father's trade. They would, they would go on and, and do work. But some children, those who, you know, had a special ability with the scriptures, they would be invited by the rabbi to go on to the next level of education. And that lasted until they were about age, I don't know, 14 or 15. In that second level of education, they would study how the forefathers interpreted the entire scriptures. So they would study all of the scriptures and what, what different rabbis said about them. And in, in those four or five years, they would memorize the entire Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. I'm like, seriously? Yeah, you look at this. This is not it. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is writing is small. This is what they would memorize. I didn't believe that at first. I'm like, there's no way that 15-year-olds are memorizing this book. Until um, I heard from a, an American, American who went to a Jewish seminary in New York City or New York. And he said that when he went into class, he was the only one who did not know the entire Old Testament by heart. I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. So at the end of age 14 or 15, like at 10, most of those kids would go on and learn the family trade. But of those students, if they desired, they could ask the rabbi to become a disciple. But before saying yes, the rabbi would question them and test them and, and make sure that that disciple had what it takes to become just like him, the rabbi. Only the best of the best could become a disciple. And often the rabbi would say to the student, you love God. You love Torah, but you don't have what it takes. Go, learn your, your father's trade. Live for God, live for Torah. But if they saw something special, he might say to you, come, follow me. And you would leave your family, and you would leave your synagogue, and you would leave your village, and you would devote your, yourself, your life, to be a disciple of that rabbi. You'd become part of his family. You'd become part of his life. And it was the highest honor available. And rabbis, all of the rabbis, they all interpreted scripture differently. And when they did, um, it, they called it their yoke. That's what the teaching was called. So um, if you became a disciple of the rabbi, you would take upon the, on yourself their yoke. You would take upon yourself their teachings and their interpretations of the scriptures. But a disciple wasn't just about knowing what the, the rabbi knows. He wanted to become just like the rabbi. And so they followed the rabbi everywhere. And they did everything that the rabbi did. And along the way, the rabbi would question them and test them and, and, and challenge them. And a blessing developed that said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you follow so close to your rabbi that the dust that they kick up as they walk, may it cover you. So that's what a disciple was. It was a new way of life, and it was an honor that very few people qualified for. So when we go back to Jesus in this statement, when he says to those disciples or to those men, those fishermen, come, follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. They left their nets at once and followed him. Let me ask you something. When he called those first men, what were they doing? They were fishing. What were they not doing? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's funny. Um, didn't think about that one coming. Um, you know what they were not doing? They were not following another rabbi. That means they didn't make it through all the schooling. They were not the best of the best. And rabbis only called the best of the best. But not Jesus. See, he picked everybody, like you and me. He picked fishermen, plain old people. He picked tax collectors, the worst of the worst. And women, they weren't even allowed to follow a rabbi. That was not allowed in their culture. 
But the, every single one of the Gospels, every one of them, talk about the women who followed Jesus. In fact, Luke talks about how women funded Jesus' ministry. Blows you away if you read that. But because they weren't working, they weren't fishing, they weren't doing stuff. He was teaching. They had to eat. They had to do stuff. And it says that the women were funding his ministry. It changed everything for everybody. Man and woman, didn't matter what you were doing, you could be a disciple of the rabbi Jesus because he came for everybody. This is not an exclusive club. So when God chose the Jews, it was to be a priest of the nations. So the Jews and non-Jews could find life in God. That's what the purpose of the Jews was, to be God's physical presence in the world. I like to call it his hands and feet. And now, through Jesus, everybody, Jews and Gentiles, we Gentiles, we are grafted into that promise, that calling through Jesus. We are his hands and feet for everybody. We don't have to be the best of the best. In fact, all we have to do is be authentic. What's amazing is over and over in Scripture, especially through the writings of Paul, you see that it is in our weakness that his power is displayed. We don't have to be the best of the best. We don't have to do everything right, cross every T, dot every I. We just have to be authentic and say, God, I'm a mess. I need you. And it is his transforming power in us that causes others to go, what is going on? So when Jesus invited these men to to follow him, of course they dropped their nets. It was the highest honor available. To follow a rabbi? What in the world? They were being invited to an honor that they did not qualify for. And Jesus, he took those not good enoughs, and what did he do? He changed the course of history. (laughs) Every person in this room is here today because of what happened when they said yes. So saying saying a prayer to accept Jesus, that's easy. But following Jesus, not so much. It's hard because it's giving away control. It's trusting God with our lives when we don't know what his plans are for our lives. See, that's faith. It's trusting. Uh, people always ask, and I always wonder too, you know, what, what is faith? Faith is trusting that God knows what he's doing and that he is good and faithful. And that no matter what the situation looks like that we're going through, it's going to end up, it might be in heaven, but it's going to end up okay. In the end, it will all be good. So when Jesus started explaining what it meant to follow him, he used these words. He used the word, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross. He hadn't died yet. So he's referring to the cross, which meant everybody had seen people hanging on crosses. The Romans loved using that tool for fear. And so it's like, take up your cross. And they're all like, and follow me. And when he said that, what did everybody start doing, man? They started leaving, leaving, leaving. Because people were like, give up my life? Take up my cross? Who wants to do that? But see, that's not the end of the statement. Because he said, he, he continued. See, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But, this is a big but, <laughs> if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You want control? Do you want your life to be about you? It's a dead end. It will not satisfy. The more you live for yourself, the emptier you become. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. If you choose to follow Jesus, his power will transform you. He will begin to make you whole. He will begin to quench this thirst in your soul that nothing else was able to quench. You will experience peace no matter what is happening to you from the outside. And you will never be alone because you will be a part of a community of believers who together have a purpose that is so much greater than any of us. It's an eternal purpose that lives can become whole. It's an eternal purpose where people can find life in Jesus. See, that's what it means to follow Christ. It's not just believing in Jesus. James in the Bible says even the demons believe. It's not just believing. It's following and becoming more and more like Jesus. It's a new way of life, and it's a lifelong journey. Today's a weird message, I know. It's a little story, a lot of stuff. But most of us 
we have prayed to accept Christ and we're just going on with our life the same way and we wonder why we're a little empty inside or it's not fulfilling or, you know, why are we doing this? But the thing is, most of us, we don't have this picture of, of Rabbi Jesus saying, follow me. Walk so closely behind me. May the dust of your rabbi cover you. Become more and more like me. It's when we do that that it changes everything. If you hang on to your life, you will lose it. It will be empty. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So Jesus invites you to follow him. And you can trust him. He gave up everything for you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to transform your life to become more and more like him. Until that day when we see him face to face, he wants us to, he, and, and it's not that we become more like him on our own power, it's his transforming power in us. We are not alone. We, we could never become like him. He just says, allow me to work in you. Until that day we see him face to face. So as, as he did then, Jesus invites you to follow him. Will you follow Rabbi Jesus? Will you follow him? If you've chosen to accept Christ in the past, awesome. That is that first step. That is that portal <laughs> into the relationship with Jesus. But are you following him daily? And maybe, have you ever finally said no to you and yes to him? Have you ever made the decision, I want to follow Jesus? Because he's inviting you to do that today. To drop your nets and follow him wherever he leads because it is a good place. It's not an easy place, and it's not a place that necessarily has no suffering. Probably is the opposite. But it's a place with eternal purpose that quenches the thirst in your soul and that leads to a life exactly the way God designed for you to become more and more like his son. So I invite you today to follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you that you gave us this picture of what it looks like to follow you. That, uh, and that, that we see a picture that these disciples, they dropped everything so that they be could become more and more like you, to follow so closely that your dust covers them. God, for us in here, there are people in this room who have chosen to follow you, but they, they live for themselves continually. I pray that you convict their hearts and you help them have the courage to turn to you and just in weakness say, I can't do it. I want to follow you. Help me. But there's also people in this room in a, in a crowd this size, there usually is, people who have never chosen to follow Jesus. They've been living for their own way. They have been living for their job, finding their identity and what they do or what they accomplish or the experiences they've had, all of that stuff. And they're empty. And Jesus, I pray right now that you will just knock on that, their heart's door, just draw them to yourself, give them the courage, give them the strength to say to you, I want to follow you. I'm no longer living for myself. I follow Jesus. God, help us to do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.